Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Roberts. And I'm Yochanan El Rome. In our top story, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban has announced that his country will establish an embassy in Jerusalem within the month. Hungary will be the first European Union member state to move their embassy to the Israeli capital. This announcement was met with backlash by the EU as well as with dissension from the Hungarian government. President Katlin Novak said that no official decision had been made on the embassy despite Orban's bold announcement. Just last week, we reported that Papua New Guinea will open its embassy in Jerusalem. The United States, Guatemala, Honduras, and Kosovo all hold embassies in the Holy City. And Israel's foreign ministry has said that they are working to bring other countries to the capital, Jerusalem, as well. Israel has announced that it will open an embassy in Turkmenistan, just 12 miles from the Iranian border. The Central Asian, Muslim-majority country has held diplomatic relations with Israel since 1991. And about 10 years ago, Jerusalem established a temporary embassy in Ashgabat. Israel's foreign minister, Eli Cohen, announced plans to visit Turkmenistan to inaugurate the permanent embassy complex. He told Israel Hayom that the inauguration of this embassy building is another sign of the strong ties between Israel and Turkmenistan and marks the 30 years of the establishment of relations between countries which are strategic, important, and are part of the activity aimed at strengthening cooperation with the entire region. Brazil has allowed two Iranian warships to drop anchor at the port in Rio de Janeiro. This despite immense pressure from the United States and Israel not to do so. U.S. Ambassador Elizabeth Begley warned Brazil not to allow the vessels to dock, saying that the IRIS Macron and the IRIS Denia have facilitated illegal trade and terrorist activities and have been sanctioned by the United States. Israel's foreign ministry released a statement urging Brazil to evict the ships from its port immediately. It said the boats are part of the Iranian Navy, which works closely and synchronizes its actions with the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, a designated terrorist entity. Azerbaijan's ambassador to Israel has officially arrived to his post, making him the first emissary of a Shiite Muslim country to the Jewish state. Israel established an embassy in Baku in 1993, and the countries have been cooperating for more than three decades. Ambassador Mukhtar Mamadov announced plans to present his diplomatic credentials to Israeli President Isaac Herzog. Azerbaijan has yet to formally establish an embassy in Israel, so Mamadov will begin his work from the country's Azeri trade office in Tel Aviv. Michal Hershkovitz, the director of the Central Asia and Caucasus Department in the Israeli Foreign Ministry, hailed Mamadov's arrival as the first Azerbaijani ambassador to Israel, calling it a historical moment. Hundreds of furious Iranians took to the streets after a wave of suspected poisonings left more than 30 schoolgirls hospitalized and made over a thousand young women sick. Parents and family members gathered outside the Iranian education ministry in Tehran to demand action, but the vigil quickly turned into yet another anti-Iranian government protest. The hardline Islamic Republic has been rocked by riots against the Ayatollah's oppressive policies. The Jerusalem Post has reported that school girls have been actively involved in the anti-Iranian government protests. Many have removed their mandated headscarves and have publicly torn up pictures of Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei calling for the death of the dictator. General Mark Milley, the chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, met with high-ranking Israeli officials to discuss the Iranian nuclear threat. Milley was hosted at the Kiryah military base in Tel Aviv, where he held talks with IDF Chief of Staff Lieutenant General Herzi Alevi, Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, and other top Israeli security officials. Israel's Defense Ministry released a statement saying the meetings focused on security developments and strengthening the special strategic ties between Israel and the U.S., as well as the continued cooperation to ensure that Iran does not obtain a nuclear weapon. Milley's visit came just days after the International Atomic Energy Agency announced that the rogue Islamic Republic has been enriching uranium to 83 percent purity, a short technical step away from 90 percent needed to make a nuclear weapon. 
The leading candidate for Scotland's National Party met with a Hamas commander. Humza Youssef, the Pakistani Scottish minister currently serving as health secretary, met with the terror group's military chief for Judea and Samaria when he was working as an assistant for Scotland's first Muslim member of parliament. The Islamist resistance movement is a recognized terror group by Canada, the United States, the EU, the UK and others. Yusuf's relationship with the Iranian-funded terror group is troubling since he is the frontrunner to replace Nicola Sturgeon as Scotland's first minister. Yusuf has repeatedly called for an arms embargo against Israel, and in light of his meetings with a known terror group, his loyalties have come into question. The Palestinian terrorist who assassinated U.S. presidential candidate Robert Kennedy in 1968 has been denied parole for the 16th time. Bobby Kennedy was an admirer of the fledgling Jewish state, and it was his support of Israel that made him a target. Kennedy visited Israel in 1948, and he wrote several articles in support of Israel. Just after winning the California Democratic presidential primary, Kennedy was gunned down by Sirhan Sirhan, a Palestinian living in the United States. Sirhan was given the death penalty, but his sentence was commuted to life in prison. El Al, Israel's national airline, has announced its biggest fourth quarter profits since 2015. The company was hit hard by the coronavirus pandemic and the subsequent shutdown. Now, under new ownership, El Al reported a return to profit in 2022. After combined losses of nearly $1 billion in 2020 and 2021, LL reported nearly $2 billion of revenue in 2022. This is an increase of 132 percent, and LL announced that it earned a net profit of $109 million last year. The company believes that it will continue to grow and estimates that it will earn an annual revenue of $3.5 billion within five years. Lithuania's foreign minister Gabrielius Landsbergis was in Israel recently where he paid a special tribute to his great-grandmother at Yad Vashem's Garden of the Righteous. Israel's National Holocaust Memorial Museum built a special tribute to those who helped save Jews during World War II. More than 20 years ago, Ona Yablonski Landsbergin was given Yad Vashem's highest honor, Righteous Among the Nations, for her heroic efforts to save a Jewish child from the Nazis. Lithuania's Jewish community suffered immensely during the Holocaust. The country had more than 210,000 Jews before the war. 95% were exterminated. Landsberger said that he was grateful for the opportunity to visit Yad Vashem and bow his head to the millions of victims of the Holocaust, some of whom were brutally murdered in Lithuania. He said the Garden of the Righteous is a hopeful testimony that even in darkest times, there will always be people who will choose light. A special service was held in Jerusalem to bless the oil that will anoint the King of England. The royal palace is gearing up for King Charles III's coronation, and an important part of that ceremony involves consecrated oil from the Holy Land. This special concoction of oils has been used by the royal family for hundreds of years. It is a combination of olive oil from the sacred Mount of Olives, fragrant rose oil, and orange blossom oil. Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, supervised the blessing ceremony at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which was presided over by the Patriarch of Jerusalem, as well as the Anglican Archbishop. Welby said, from ancient kings through to present day, monarchs have been anointed with oil from this sacred place. Israel is playing host to thousands of special winged visitors. The spring crane migration to Israel's Hula Valley is one of the most exciting times of the year. Hula Lake Park has become the most popular bird watching site in Israel, where over 500 million birds from 400 species stop twice a year on their migratory path from Europe to Africa and then back. More than 100,000 cranes travel to Israel from Russia and Scandinavia, and about 40,000 of them choose to winter in the Jewish state. That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein.
Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in our beautiful studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is Yaakov Katz. He's the editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post. Yaakov, thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Josh. Yaakov, tell our viewers a little bit about the Jerusalem Post. Well, the Jerusalem Post is a daily English language newspaper in Israel, a Hebrew-speaking country. We've been around for 90 years now. We were established in 1932. So it's been printing every day, six days a week, essentially, except for Shabbat, except for Saturday. Now we're much more than just a daily newspaper, wide-ranging website that reaches millions of people every day. We have conferences around the world just in the last year in London, in Marrakesh, Morocco, in Dubai, uh, in New York, and of course in Jerusalem. So that's what we do. We tell stories about Israel and we also showcase Israel to the world. You're really the newspaper of record. Uh, your your original name was the Palestinian Post. Or, or the Palestine Post. The Palestine Post, which is even predates the state of Israel. Right. Uh, and today, when people want to know about Israel, they, they go down to the website and they check it out. Why has it been such a draw for people, not just in Israel or even the Jewish community, but around the world? Well, I think that there is a fascination with this land, right? There's a fascination with the story that is told here that has to do with the fact that there is a lot of the roots of our faith, of the Jewish faith, of Christianity, of Islam are here in this land. And that naturally will draw not millions, not hundreds, but billions of people who want to know what's happening here. And it's just, it's a magnet to that focus and the attention of the world. So, you know, we are a Zionist Jewish run newspaper. So our focus is obviously going to be on the uh, Jewish audience. But we've in recent years, we've started to kind of veer off a bit and reach out to other audiences, including a faith based Christian audience. Yes. Uh, on the website, you have the Christian world, which are actually right. stories geared towards Christians. Why was that important for the Jerusalem Post? What we've noticed over the years, you know, it's it's an audience that has uh, specific interests. Not every story that's going to interest a Jew in New York is going to interest a, an evangelical in Alabama or Texas or somewhere else across the United States. We want to be able to increase our audience and increase our reach and also engage more with people who want to engage with us. And to do that as a newspaper or as a news site, you have to provide them with the content that they're going to be interested in. So that's something that we're we're playing around. We're trying to figure out exactly what it what it means and what it can do and how many people can come. And what we've seen just essentially is more people are reading, which is good. One of the sections that I really like is the archaeological section. Uh, it's very unique in a newspaper to have a whole section about archaeology. Where does this coming from? Well, I'll tell you, Josh, we have uh, People are fascinated with this stuff. Uh, personally, I also am. You know, I think in all of us, there's a little kid who wants to be Indiana Jones, right, <laughs> to, to an extent. And uh, there are just amazing discoveries in this country on almost a daily basis, from coins from the Bar Kokhba revolt to new mosaics discovered in an ancient church somewhere in the Galilee, to new Dead Sea Scrolls, to, to, to new uh, inscriptions that now, because of technology, whether it's MRIs or special x-rays, they can now read and, and, and dis decipher what's written in these stone etched writings. It's incredible and it's all taking place here. So I'm fascinated with it and I see that my readers are. And what we've also found is that it's for people who are of a faith-based, coming from a faith-based place, right? If that's what their interest is, whether Jewish, whether Christian, whether, whether Muslim, they're also fascinated with this because it goes back thousands of years. It tells me that we're just a little blimp, if I could call it that, in, in the story of, of what's happening in this ancient land. And uh, we have to remember what came before us to know where we're going. You know, it's interesting in Israel, news breaks so fast. Yeah. I mean, there's something happening every single minute. There was a big joke that you'll never find a weather section in the newspaper here because there's just not enough room for it. How do you keep up with that amount of news all the time? It's true that this country is a bit crazy, right? I often <laughs> tend to look at it that way. Uh, the news here, what, what, we, what we do in a day, other countries could do in a year, right? And, 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 that's part of the story of, the, of Israel, right? It's the fact that we have these external threats that don't give us a second to rest, whether it's Hamas and Gaza, Hezbollah and Lebanon, Iran and its pursuit of a nuclear capability. We have political division within our country as well. And, and that's something that we have to learn to deal, deal with. We've seen that go through going, the country go through five elections in the span of three and a half years. So we know very well what that means. Uh, but we deal with it by telling those stories, by helping our readers navigate and, and understand for the, and help them understand what's really happening here. 
Well, so we're deep into 2023 now. What are the three main stories that you see in 2003 continuing? What are the ongoing stories, the big stories coming out of this year? Well, I think, you know, it, it, you're going to have three, pretty much three big stories. The first is going to be still this political division exists, right? We, we didn't, just because we now have a government that seems stable doesn't mean that this is all over. It's not. It's still with us. And, and we need to find a way to come back together again as a country. The second is I think Iran, this is going to be a big year for Iran. I know we say that every year, but this year is particularly going to be a big year because they're continuing to pursue with their capability. Netanyahu is back in power with the goal of trying to stop them. He's working to get the United States and Europe back together with Israel and aligned to, uh, to try and stop that. And I think that the third big piece of this is still this Israeli story that I don't know what I don't know what, what 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 to tell you it is. It's the startup nation. It's the innovation. It's the archaeological findings. It's these amazing stories that come out every day that sometimes they blow my mind. And I've been doing this for over 20 years now as a journalist, but I can still get excited from a story like that. Yeah, there are literally tens of millions of people watching the show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? What I would tell the audience is you have an opportunity to engage with Israel. You have an opportunity to learn about Israel. You could do that at the Jerusalem Post. You could do that on Josh's show. But don't miss that opportunity. If you're interested in what's happening here, take advantage of it. Learn about Israel. Care about Israel. This is your moment. Thank you, Yaakov, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. Up next, the return to Zion with Karen Hayasod. Shalom and welcome to the return to Zion with Karen Hayasod. I'm Sam Grundwerg, world chairman of Karen Hayasod the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. We live in a time where the God of Israel is fulfilling His prophecies right before our very eyes. Join us as we work together to defend the covenant. Those who dreamed about the Jewish state, those who survived the Holocaust and found in Israel the anchor, the security, those who wrought the historical miracle and against all odds established a state. Those who stepped into the breach and defended the young Jewish state, so many of them paid with their lives. Those who arrived in the homeland to their new home. Those who propelled Israel forward, step after step. Those who stand at the technological vanguard and the loyal partners who ensure the continuation of the Zionist enterprise. All those are Karen Hayasod because Karen Hayasod is Eretz Israel. The return of an ancient people to their biblical homeland, a nation whose values inspired mankind only to endure centuries of suffering. The ultimate tale of redemption from the ashes of destruction. This remarkable story is the story of the State of Israel. It is also the story of Karen Hayasod. Thanks to the dedication of Karen Hayasod supporters, huge resources were available to make the State of Israel a reality. Founded in 1920, Karen Hayasod galvanized Jewish donors across the world in a unified effort to develop the infrastructure of the first sovereign Jewish state in 2,000 years. By the time the state of Israel was born in 1948, Karen Hayasod's funds had been the driving force behind the establishment of over 900 communities in the Jewish homeland. Its donors helped found many of the iconic institutions we know today, including the Hebrew University and Israel's Philharmonic Orchestra, ensuring that as Zachariah envisioned, Jerusalem's streets would once more be filled with boys and girls at play. Karen Hayasod's supporters also helped rescue tens of thousands of desperate Jews fleeing a burning Europe, bringing them to the sanctuary of the land of Israel. Ezekiel's prophecy of bringing dry bones to life had been fulfilled. 
Throughout the decades, Karen Hayasad has been there for Jewish people coming home. In the 1950s, by financing the creation of still vibrant cities, Eilat and Sterot, bringing to life Ben-Gurion's vision of making the Negev desert bloom. In the 1960s and 70s, raising funds and providing a lifeline for the country's development during wartime. And at the close of the century, helping to bring immigrants from the four corners of the earth in a modern day exodus, rescuing tens of thousands of Jews from Ethiopia and one million Jews from the former Soviet Union, delivering them from danger and distress. To this day, Karen Hayasud's activists continue their mission of Aliyah and absorption. Last year, more than 31,000 Jews were helped to make their lives in the land of their ancestors. Karen Hayasud remains at the heart of Israel's development, as Israel's barren land has been transformed into a hub of creativity, innovation, and success. Karen Hayasud's supporters have been there every step of the way. They have empowered 2,000 pioneering young Israelis to reinvigorate 65 distressed communities. All of this has been achieved through Karen Hayasod's ongoing efforts to build unbreakable bonds with Israel among Jews in the diaspora, Christians, and people of faith from across the world. In the book of Jeremiah, the Lord says, there is a hope for your future. Your children will return to their borders. Every day, Karen Hayasod supporters are making this vision a reality. Thanks to Karen Hayasod, the state of Israel continues to grow from strength to strength. Let's bless Israel together. Now's the time for you to get involved. Assist Karen Hayasod to raise the necessary funds in order to bring Jews yearning for their homeland back to Israel. Your donation can help fulfill the biblical prophecy today. To donate and get information, visit our website at www.khisrael.org. And now, Shining Light from Israel. Nestled just south of the modern city of Tel Aviv is the ancient coastal city of Jaffa. Go to Jaffa. That was an insult for fishermen and seamen from the Netherlands who worked here in the 1600s in the Jaffa port. That's because this port was so dangerous. There are jetties and rocks in this shallow water that make it very difficult for large boats to come in to drop off goods and people. Did you know that the Jaffa port has been operational for more than 7,000 years? That's older than ancient Egypt, which is one of the oldest societies in the world. Here at the Jaffa port, exports included leather, soap, glass, ceramics. But one thing that was needed to import here was wood. Story time. Did you know that Jaffa was mentioned in the Talmud? That's right, King Solomon had a strong relationship with the ruler of Tyre, Lebanon, and because of that connection, he was able to secure cedar wood from up in the northern part of this coastline. It was brought all the way here to Jaffa and then taken down the road to Jerusalem where it was used to build the mighty Second Holy Temple. The three Abrahamic religions are represented all right here in Jaffa, and Christianity is one of them. Here we are at St. Peter's Church, where Christians believe that St. Peter came and raised Tabitha from the dead. Tabitha was a woman who was really revered by those in her community, and when she died, the neighbors were deeply disturbed. And that's when Peter apparently came, prayed, and brought her back to life. Underneath this church is a Byzantine temple as well. 
St. Peter's Church was restored in 1903, and in 1799, it became famous for hosting Napoleon from France, who made a campaign and stopped over here in the Holy Land. In addition to that, you should understand that St. Peter's Church is still in service, and in fact, the prayer ceremonies are conducted in Polish, Hebrew, English, and Spanish. Moving into the modern part of Jaffa, here we are in front of the clock tower. It's an orienting landmark and it's quintessential to the feel of the city. I know I'm in Jaffa when I see this, but did you know that there are actually seven in total around the state of Israel in historic cities? This clock tower was created by an Israeli who was commissioned to honor the Ottoman Sultan Abdul Hamid II. There's a biblical story that I'd like to share with you, and that's because it takes place here in the Jaffa port. And this is a tribute to the story of Jonah and the whale. Jonah heard from God that he had a mission to go to the people of Nineveh and convince them that they needed to do better as a nation. Instead, he goes down to the Jaffa port and gets on a boat going in the very opposite direction. Well, he didn't know that God had a plan. He was thrown off of the boat during a violent storm and tossed right into the belly of a whale. He ended up being successful in his mission, and now it's our mission to take you to see some other sites in Jaffa that are really impressive. This ancient city is still thriving. It's thriving with Jews, Arabs, and Christians who all live here. Having beautiful jewelry and arts and crafts and handmade items from local artists. You may even be tempted to take a boat ride and see the beautiful Tel Aviv coastline. You can also dine at wonderful restaurants. On your next trip to Israel, make sure to come visit the ancient city of Jaffa. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Roberts. And I'm Yochanan El Rome, reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all of your Israel updates.